Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Haley Minogue. And I'm Eric King. For about a year now on Good Morning Kentuckiana, we've been showing you the people and the places and things that make us Kentuckiana proud. And I have to say, one of those things that makes us the most proud here at WHAS 11 is the Crusade for Children. This year, because of you, 200 fire departments and scores of local businesses, the Crusade for Children raised more than $6.2 million. 100% of that money goes right back to bettering the lives and care of children with special needs here in Kentuckiana. And what keeps it all running behind the scenes is a woman with a legacy of giving back. Take a look. Her face may be familiar if you've ever been involved with the Crusade for Children, but her story is one you probably don't know. I grew up in Kenya, um, East Africa, and I met uh, my children's dad. I met him uh, in Kenya many, many, many years ago. And so I had never been to Kentucky, never knew anybody from Kentucky. Um, didn't know anything about Kentucky. The daughter of missionaries, a high bar was set in her family for giving back and helping others. After more than a decade of fundraising in the athletics department at UofL and working with CASA to help local children, Lee was ready for a new challenge. Her connection to the Crusade started long before she even moved to Kentucky when she met former Crusade CEO, oh, look at Rebecca Jackson. $5,013,953. So I actually met her in Kenya before I even lived in Louisville, came to Kentucky. Um, and we all that knew her in Kenya knew her as Becky Jackson. She never said that she was the county judge executive. She never said. Um, and so making that, reconnecting with Rebecca on this side of the ocean, uh, she was at the crusade at the time and had health problems and had said she had some health problems and was going to step away. Dawn saw the opportunity to join the organization as Jackson stepped away, becoming the CEO 15 years ago. Three, two, one. Now in its 70th year, the Crusade for Children has contributed more than $205 million to serve special needs children Let's go. in all 120 Kentucky counties and more than 50 Southern Indiana counties. I think the Crusade is a phenomenon that brings the people of this community together year after year, going on 70 years now, um, that is unique to our community. Really show that we are part of the greatest event of all. Way we open up our hearts for the crusade. I don't think um, it happens anywhere else, and that's the reason that we are the longest running, most successful local telethon. At the end of the day, the WHAS Crusade for Children is about the kids. It always has been, and it always will be. Don Lee hopes to continue the legacy for as long as she possibly can. And when you can meet a child in his or her family, oh my gosh, and to just see the impact that, that it's been. And when you can follow some of these kids, and being here 15 years now, the twins that I met the first week I was here are now gonna be 15 this year. And so for me to think about that, it's just like, holy cow. Um, this, is, this is a miracle right here that, that, uh, that I've watched grow. Um, so the kids are always the most incredible part of what we do and the changes that we make. Here's to the crusade and WHAS, to all of you who donate, you know you are the best. Really show that we are part of the greatest event of all, the way we open up our hearts for the crusade. And it is never too late to get involved with the crusade. Just take a look right here at your screen. You can see we have several ways for you to donate. You can scan that QR code right there on your screen, or you can go to WHAScrusade.org. Another big source of pride here in Kentucky Anna, is, of course, sports, particularly the UofL women's basketball team led by Jeff Waltz. He's the winningest coach in the program's entire history, but his road to the top spot here started with a flurry of long shots he had to take just to finish college. I actually uh, had the opportunity to play a few years of college basketball at Northern Kentucky, uh, then decided after a few years of that uh, wasn't quite good enough. Uh, so I like to say I retired. Retired is a bit of a loose term for Coach Jeff Waltz in this context because when he stepped away from playing, he also stepped away from a scholarship. And that meant he needed to figure out a way to come up with tuition money. So he started coaching seventh grade girls basketball. 
it was really an opportunity to uh, to just coach. Uh, as I said, I was trying to figure out a way to pay for uh, for college, and really enjoyed it. Never even dreamed that one day I'd be coaching college basketball. Not only is he coaching, he's got a national championship title under his belt from his time in Maryland, and he's taken two Louisville teams to the championship game, ushered in a new team culture, and cultivated the biggest fan base in program history. You build relationships with, with players, and some of them have a style that they want to come play for. And it, it's worked, you know, and we work extremely hard as a staff and I work hard to, to, to get out in the, in the community um, and just try to encourage people to come to the game. You get them to come to one game and I think if they come to one, they'll, they'll come back. And that's kind of how we built this program, one fan on top of another. While the accomplishments and accolades are often listed as his, Walt is quick to redirect them to the players. We've had a lot of success. We've done some great things on the basketball court, but they've done a lot of amazing things in the community, in, in, in the city, of giving back. And I think that's why we have the fan support that we have. Coach Wall says he is most proud of his consistency over the last 16 years. And we all know Kentuckiana doesn't have a Major League Baseball team, but we've worked ourselves into the conversation with Louisville Slugger. It turns out the man in charge of making sure the majors are perfect actually had no intention of ever working at the Slugger factory. Take a look. Slugger is kind of like the Kentucky baseball team. There's a good chance if you've visited the Slugger Museum on Main Street, you followed this path. So anybody that has ever swung in a Louisville Slugger that plays baseball, you're getting a little piece of Kentucky whenever you do that. So that, that makes me proud. To watch where the major league bats are made. Starting out, I couldn't have been further from this place. A University of Kentucky graduate, Kelly Coleman was laid off at a job in Mount Sterling and took a slugger factory job temporarily just for a couple of months 11 years ago. When you walk in the door, it can be sensory overload. You know, you're dealing with, with wood things that you've never dealt with before. You're usually looking at the very finished product when you look at a Louisville slugger bat. But here we're like really taking the microscopic look and going behind the scenes. An early riser, just like me, Coleman starts out the day by eyeing a list of professional baseball players. He'll have the pleasure and pressure of making a bat for that day. Whenever you, you come in and, you know, the top ticket is a former rookie of the year, MVP quality baseball player, you know that they're looking for the best and uh, you got to meet that challenge. For someone who never planned on making baseball bats, especially making bats at the level he's doing it, Kelly Coleman just has to laugh sometimes about what five-year-old him would think of his job now. Five-year-old me loves me right now. It just, I mean, five-year-old me, like, wanted to play baseball, was like, I'm going to the major leagues. This is happening. So for me, in a way, to be in the major leagues by making bats is kind of like, you know, like a silver medal, I guess, but it's still pretty great. Haley Minogue, WHAS 11, on your side. Now you can visit Kelly Coleman and other bat makers at the Louisville Slugger Museum with a ticket seven days a week. We've got details for you on how to get those in the hours on WHAS 11.com. The Fairness Campaign is Kentucky's leading LGBTQ plus advocacy organization working to create protections from discrimination. At the helm for more than a dozen years is Bellarmine graduate Chris Hartman. Hartman is often a party of one, lobbying in Frankfurt during the days, leading rallies on nights and weekends, and doing the legwork at all times in between with unquestionable motivation. Yeah, if I had another job, it might be more difficult to get up and, and go do all of this um, every day and all the time, but we got to protect our kids. Uh, I mean, the, the, you're right, the weight of the responsibility of working to protect the few rights that our queer kids have to show them that they are loved, to show them that there are people who are out here fighting for them. And, and it's not just the kids. I mean, it's our whole community. The Fairness Campaign is now statewide. 24 Kentucky communities have enacted fairness ordinances outlawing LGBTQ discrimination in employment, housing, and public accommodations. Every single day, new cancer cases rock Kentuckiana families to their cores. And it's not just a struggle for the person diagnosed, but for their loved ones as well. And we want to introduce you to a woman tasked with creating an environment where everyone can really feel their feelings while fighting cancer. 
got the news on a break from work one day and I was by myself. Uh, so I went back to work and sat in the parking lot and eventually one of my teammates realized I, I wasn't back and so they came to find me uh, and they were the first person to learn that I had cancer. Gilda's Club Kentuckiana Chief Operating Officer Lori Mangum's cancer diagnosis years ago left her feeling like she was missing a certain level of support from people who truly understood what she was going through. I'll be really honest, I didn't go for four months after I heard about it. And part of it was because I just didn't want to sit around and kumbaya about cancer. You know, like I was living that every single day. Um, but eventually they wore me down <laughs> and I went. Gilda's Club is a cancer support community focusing not only on patients receiving care, but on their families. They offer all kinds of events daily, like support dinner, where people can come, get a plate, and talk to others who can share their experience. You're allowed to feel how you feel. You know, you should have safe spaces in your life to be honest about those feelings around other people that are safe, that can help you work through that, or that can just receive it for the day. We're not about trying to fix the problems that exist. We can't cure cancer at Gilda's Club as much as I wish we could. With tens of thousands of new cancer diagnoses between Kentucky and Indiana yearly, it's nearly impossible to not have a personal connection to cancer. Mangum says that's why their support is so critical and why anyone can find comfort with their organization. If you come through our big red doors on Grinstead Drive um, or our big red doors on the second floor of the Republic Bank Foundation YMCA in West Louisville, um, you're gonna see smiling faces who understand what you're going through and you're just gonna be received and then you get to make your own journey from there. Haley Minogue, WHAS 11, on your side. Gilda's Club Kentuckiana is always looking for more volunteers to join their mission. For how to sign up and a full calendar of events, you can go to the story on our website, whas11.com. One thing we've seen recently are a number of bills that have been passed in legislatures around the country, also here in Kentuckiana, that have been identified by the Fairness Campaign as anti-gay and anti-trans. Now it's against that backdrop that many young people struggle to be public about their authentic selves. Louisville's Nick Albiero is one of those young people. As the only out gay man on the U.S. national swimming team, he hopes his journey is one that prompts others to live out loud. Defending NCAA champion, can he do it for tonight for his fifth crown at the ACC's? A swimmer's vision is often limited in goggles. He's not overconfident. He knows the job that's at hand. He's the defending NCAA champion, one of the first for Louisville. They but Nick Albiero well. sees himself clearly. And now, the world does too. I don't feel like, oh, this is up to me and like I'm going to let the whole community down. I don't feel that. And I don't want to feel that. <laughs> I feel like, no, I have more support than, than just a normal person. Nick recently graduated from U of L, where he earned his MBA, 12 national titles, and 16 total ACC titles. Today, he's training for the 2024 Olympics in Paris. To make the Olympic team, I th think I'm representing more than just me, my team, and my family. It's a whole community that I'm so grateful to be a part of, especially in Louisville. Nick is the only out gay man on the U.S. national team. And while that shouldn't matter, it does. He's quick to point out how lucky he is to have supportive parents and friends, but he's equally fast to point out the struggles of attending a local Christian high school while trying to figure out exactly who he was and who he wanted to be. I'm still recovering from that. I've gotten help, but um, just when you're told who you are for so long, you lose yourself. And I think going to college, yes, but then I took some time away from the sport of swimming last summer and I just was trying to figure out which end is up. There's power in being unique, being the only one, the trailblazer. But there's also a responsibility, and Nick knows it. I just want to make sure that kids like me around the world in the U.S. are seeing someone that they feel represents them, because I never had that growing up. I never had an out male swimmer who was doing the things that I'm trying to do. Nick barely missed making the 2021 Olympic team. He hopes to compete at the World Championships this summer. 
than the Olympic trials with the goal of competing in the 200 meter butterfly in the 2024 Olympic Games in Paris. All right, let's talk about second chances. So right in the heart of old Butcher Town, there is a hidden gem that's been given some brand new life. Yeah, so we're talking about Vernon Lanes. It was shut down for years, but thanks to one Kentuckian, it's back and better than ever. There's a lot of life in this old bowling alley. We did the bar and reconfigured this, this room here. Well, this new old bowling alley. <laughs> They're all fantastic. Yeah, I mean, this one, uh, 1954. They're all, and they all say Vernon Lanes on them, yeah. Inside this 150-year-old building, you'll find lanes dating back to the 1910s. Floors and pin setters from 1968. Not quite as far back. Tony Edlin's relationship with the building has some history. When he moved to Louisville from Springfield with his wife 13 years ago, he joined a sports networking league and found himself bowling at Vernon Lanes once a week. I had a few friends here, so we all, we all joined and made a lot of friends through that, actually. Well, we started off doing kickball, and then I'm a lot better bowler than I am kickball player. <laughs> so that was a natural progression for me. I just thought it was a really cool place, and uh, we always had a great time here. And, you know, it had really been getting run down in the later, the later times that we were coming. And eventually, you know, it sold and closed. And at the time that it did, that it closed, uh, a couple of my friends, we were, you know, thinking it'd be really cool if we could buy that place. But at the time, we didn't have the means to do so. A gutter ball. But when the chance returned years later, Tony Edlin squared up and rolled. He joined two other experienced business owners in buying Vernon Lanes, rehabbing the building and opening in March of 2022. We're not quite at a year, but uh, thus far we're very pleased with our progress and I think 2023 is going to be great, but we just want to continue to grow with the neighborhood. Um, I'm really excited to see how everything kind of develops here over the next 10 years. Instead of viewing the old and new as a split, they found just the right touch to clear up the frame. That always brings a smile to my face whenever people kind of come back and and uh, you know are happy that the place you know that was that has been revitalized and uh, ha have new generations enjoying it. With photojournalist Jessica Farley, I'm Haley Minogue, WHAS 11 on your side. Vernon Lanes is open every day of the week from noon until 2 a.m. All the world is a stage. It's a widely popular phrase dating all the way back to Shakespeare. And for Robert Barry Fleming, the executive artistic director at Actors Theater, the idea that every part of our world is in some way art is the backbone to the plays that have made the local theater a powerhouse in inclusive arts. Say her name! Breonna Taylor! The death of Breonna Taylor and the months of protest and struggle that followed changed this. The pandemic and the continued struggles that came with it changed us. I think life has that way of um, putting you in the right place at the right time, even if it feels like the wrong place at the wrong time. But art is often created in the depth of struggle. And Robert Barry Fleming, who took the reins at Actors Theater just months before the pandemic, knows it. That fluidity and uh, that dynamic was, uh, um, I think, life changing, certainly for me personally. But for most of us, our industry has been transformed. Inclusivity has been central to the mission of actors since its early days in the 1960s. Today, that effort not only lives, it thrives with the primary focus on us. Our colleagues at the Kentucky Performing Arts Center are, uh, are remarkable. They're, they're kind of a touring venue that bring productions in. We tend to be grassroots built it from within our own community. So you'll see a lot of um, combinations of New York, LA, Chicago actors with local extraordinary talent it, 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 behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, building and offering work that is relevant and resonant for our community specifically. Robert's deep understanding of us starts with growing up in Frankfurt. His parents spent decades working at Kentucky State University and the University of Kentucky. My privilege is that I was born to two professors who happened to, um, they both were brilliant. They both were life learners. Um, and so what they were understanding about the world and how they were engaging in the world, the challenges that they encountered and how they navigated them were just total gifts. After working on stages and at universities and theaters around the country, maybe that goes mm -hmm. in that space. Robert has come back to Kentucky to continue the legacy of service started by his parents. We're surrounded by brilliant people every single day 
sharing their stories and being able to find find the way to say that story sounds a lot like this story sounds a lot like that is the biggest gift to, to in understanding how connected we really are. You can find out more about upcoming shows at the Actors Theater's website, actorstheater.org. From prodigy to world-class conductor and musician, Teddy Abrams is the driving force behind a new Louisville orchestra. It's an orchestra that's accessible to everyone. That's everything that I've tried to do because the orchestra sadly uh, has developed a stereotype and a reputation around the world, not just in Louisville, obviously. Orchestras as a concept, this, this reputation of being only for certain people, certain people that can afford it, certain people that look uh, a certain way, uh, people that grew up with that kind of music. And my whole belief is that if you say, say that you're the Louisville Orchestra, or you're the New York Philharmonic, or the London Symphony, I don't care what it is, but if the name of that city is in your title, then you belong to the people. We're the Louisville Orchestra, we belong to Louisville. And that means a whole lot of people with a lot of different perspectives on life, a lot of different backgrounds, and a lot of different stories. So our music belongs to them. And if we're not serving them and we're not creating a place that they feel that they actually own, this is their place, it's their house when they come to the concert hall, then we're failing. We're failing the city. Uh, and everything I've tried to do revolves around that belief. Abrams told us he's wanted to be a conductor since he was nine years old. His entire life, he's been chasing the dream. Now, he's using his leadership to put importance on access. He also says during a time when public discourse can be so polarizing, music is a roadmap to understanding. You can find the Louisville Orchestra's concert calendar on louisvilleorchestra.org. So driving down 71 toward the city near the impound lot and on top of the old city dump, Beauty springs from the discarded. The talented team tasked with growing from trash, which seems impossible, works year round to ensure our community always has a fresh perspective. We want you to meet the director of horticulture at the Waterfront Botanical Gardens. You know, in the United States, everyone wants a perfect like carpet lawn that's green. Everything is tidy, just like, you know, like their formal living room or dining room might be. But here, none of our plants are dead, of course, but you know, they're dormant in the winter, but there's still a lot of beauty, particularly in the textures and then the colors that you see. There's a subdued beauty in the winter. Changing your surroundings and changing your perspective. There's tons you can learn about plants at the Botanical Garden, even in the off season. There's tons you can learn about yourself. You know, there's all kinds of things that are happening around us. Um, and a botanical garden is a nice way to connect with the, the very land on which, you know, our life unfolds. Four years ago, Jamie Berghardt came to Louisville to accept the director of horticulture position at the botanical gardens here in Louisville. The Minnesota native is humble, hardworking, and funny. So I went into um, college to get a biology degree. Everyone else was pre-med or pre-vet. And I'm like, I like plants. Part of the allure of the city for Jamie is much of what we all love about the city as well. Small but big, fast paced but slow, old but new. I love history and interesting stories and Louisville has a lot of them. And, and, and that ties in nicely with our garden and the fact that we are on top of the former Ohio Street dump, which formed on top of a historic neighborhood in the point. So if you literally dig down, you are digging into history. As we walked around the gardens, Jamie showed me all the ways the sea of darker colors can come to life, making me think differently about the gardens and encouraging a mentality of perspective in more parts of life. It's ornamental now, but you know, we'll have to wait until March when finally these buds swell and we get the white petals of the star magnolia again. So you, but it's green. You know, you have some Yeah, I mean it, it shows that it's alive. It's just yeah. that, you know, it's it's dormant now. It's just waiting for the right you know, photo period, the length of day and the right temperatures to break out of that dormancy. Sharing his knowledge of plants and gifting a better self understanding. In Louisville, I'm Haley Minogue, WHAS 11 on your side. That is country star Luke Bryan that you see there having a little farm party in September. He's bringing the party to Shelbyville as part of his farm tour. Shelbyville is one of only five stops on that entire tour. Right, the tour is going to put the city and a local farm on the map in a major way. 
WHAS 11 photojournalist Phil Landers takes us to Mulberry Orchard. We're super excited to be hosting Luke Bryan. Here's to the farmer, the plants, the fields, and the spring. September 14th. Uh, we're really excited to have him out to our part of Shelby County and get to have him out on the farm and should be a great time for our community. 2,000 acres of beans and cattle. Everything already sown in grass, so we'll have a nice um, grass area for the concert and the stage and everyone to hang out and enjoy the day. Just the tourism dollars that uh, come in from an event like that, the number of people that are coming in. Staying in local hotels, they're checking out, you know, the bourbon trail, the antique shops in town, um, all the people that are coming in to eat at the restaurants as well. McKinley's Cafe, we've been here for 26 years, right on Main Street in Shelbyville. We're excited. Uh, this is a big event for Shelbyville. We're so happy to see a main uh, streamlined event come here and uh, the business that it'll bring. Uh, it'll showcase this wonderful town. I have tickets to the concert, so I expect to see a great concert under the stars at Mulberry Farm. That's going to be a great venue. Traffic and parking is something that we've been working really hard on. We've also got help of all of our local law enforcement, um, and we feel like we have got a great plan in place to get people into the venue. We're excited about having the new blacktop and having everything looking pretty out here. We're going to have a lot of cars out on the road and want to make sure that the roads are in the best shape. There's a lot of different options when you're coming to our farm because we're a little ways off the interstate. There's three different exits off 64 that you could use and then coming from the north from Oldham County area there's 71 as well and feel like we've got a great plan in place to get them here and enjoy the day. The Luke Bryan Show is on September 14th. VIP tickets are sold out, but some GAs are still available. That's one of my favorite things about this. We were talking about the value of an artist going to a smaller town really changes the economics of it. Well, I think, too, that's what Kentucky and a Proud is really all about, right? People who some are from here, some are not from here. Some have just come to love Louisville, even if it's just for a short period of yep. time. And all of the surrounding communities, right, that they are just pouring back in. There's something so inspiring about Kentuckiana that just really makes you want to invest. I like that we don't always focus on leadership. You know, you've mm -hmm. got mayors, you've got governors and things like that, but the people who really deserve the attention are often the ones that don't get it. Yes. And I think that was one of our big uh, kind of reasons why we wanted to do this. Absolutely. It was a blast doing it too. We're so happy that you all let us tell you some of those stories from the community. And remember, you can watch us every weekday on Good Morning Kentuckiana starting at 430.